Hey, this is Sundance D. Giovanni, CEO of MLG, and you're listening to BBV's The Loser Bracket. Everybody, welcome to the 60th episode of VV Gaming's podcast, The Losers Bracket. This is the final episode of The Losers Bracket before MLG Dallas, and what better way to celebrate the opening of the 2011 MLG season than bringing on the CEO of MLG, Sundance De Giovanni? He will be here in just a few minutes, but before we get to that interview, we've got a couple of news items we're going to touch on real quick. First things first, we got some StarCraft 2 news, VVV Roar. What's going on in the world of StarCraft? I heard that a StarCraft 2 player just got sponsored by uh, Sony Ericsson. Give us some details. Uh, definitely. It's actually a TLO, or Darius, as most people know him. Um, he had great success in the beta. He was actually very humble about it. Um, that's one reason that I like him so much. And then he actually continued his success throughout the game. He's done really well for himself. Team Liquid actually picked him up. But, I mean, obviously with MLG, uh, Sony Ericsson sponsorship, you know, this is just so huge for him. I'm pretty excited for him, and I'm happy that, you know, sponsorships are coming out outside of the Korea land, I guess, you know. Um, other people are getting uh, the showmanship that they deserve. Um, he's a pretty good player, and I know that he actually dropped out of the GSL, so this is actually a great move for him in that sense, too, simply because he can actually focus now primarily on the um, – NA side of the server, and you know, with NASAL coming out, and also uh, another thing I'm going to touch on with the IGN League coming out, the IGN Pro League, which I believe is going to be a team league. So, a lot of huge stuff going on right now. Let's talk about that. Um, I know it was put out on the Team Liquid website, and I had also heard sort of behind the scenes uh, that this was coming. What was leaked on the Team Liquid site as far as this IGN Pro League? As far as what was leaked, um, it seems like uh, IGN actually just two days ago, I believe, announced that they're going to make an announcement for an announcement. And then just today we had um, a post on SK Gaming saying um, that IGN is going to get into the StarCraft II scene competitively. He also said that he wants to shed some light that there's going to be a prize pool between 150000 250000 and it's going to release in about uh, 13 days if you go to IGN.com slash Pro League. One of the things that interests me about this is that between Major League Gaming, North American Star League, now IGN, it seems to me there is going to be a literal saturation of the StarCraft market. There's going to be a lot of opportunities for a lot of players to play a lot of games. Is it too much? I mean, the, the general answer might be, no, it's all fantastic. When we start to think about how that would schedule out, what do you think is the feeling from the players as it sits right now? I actually haven't got to contact a bunch of my players. I'm sure all of them think it's great. But then in a sense of a management for myself, I know players' times are spread thin already. I mean, um, obviously there's a lot of smaller online tournaments that a lot of them like to compete in. There's ESEA, there's SEVO, there's SCL, there's SGL. There's just so many team leagues out there, so many different leagues. I mean, you have MLG, you're going to have NACL, you're going to have uh, IGN's Pro League. I mean, it's going to be really, really time-consuming. Are they going to be able to balance them all at once? Um, I mean, if you look at the Korean scene, they do it pretty well down there. There's just one guy that has this complete market. It's GSL, and all the focus goes to GSL. I have a feeling that sooner or later, even though they're not trying to compete with each other, MLG, NASL, and uh, IGM Pro League are going to have to start fighting for time spots, who's going to play when, who's going to get the better players, etc. I imagine in a lot of ways this is just going to drown out uh, the smaller tournaments because players are obviously going to be focused on these these major events. So it looks like things are really going to get pretty serious in the StarCraft world. And I look forward to hearing what a lot of players feel as far as their lifestyle and what changes are going to be. 
Let me ask this question before we let you go, Roar. How is the division doing? What should people look out for in the next couple of weeks, at least from VV Gaming StarCraft Division? Well, in the next upcoming week, we are actually going to end our ESA preliminary round, and we are right now actually 12-3 and three with uh, three more matches to go. We're looking semi-strong there. I'd like to have a better finish, so hopefully we do finish out 15-3 and three to end the season, and then we'll be going to playoff rounds there. Um, coming into Dallas, everyone is just freaking pumped. I know everyone is spamming games. Titan basically told me yesterday he's going to be mad if he comes in a second. So he's looking to take first. Uh, Murder's feeling his cocky self, and Time's getting pumped. He actually uh, is having a week with his fiance, so he's getting all excited for that, and he's glad that he got some a little bit of time off and get to recharge his battery. And I guess his fiance uh, is thinking about coming out too. So a lot of cool stuff, a lot of uh, good backing going on. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. I guess I'm going to see you in Dallas, sir. Oh, definitely. I'll see you guys uh, for some good old dinner. Going to give me some fish tacos. Absolutely, yeah. We're going to have our VV Gaming uh, staff dinner Friday night. Uh, we're going to get a little private area and uh, sit back and uh, talk a lot of competitive gaming business. Invite a few friends that uh, are actually good business contacts and go from there. All right, Roy, thank you so much. All right, Jason, what to next? Do you want to talk about a little Halo news? Most definitely. You know, TLO wasn't the only person that Sony Ericsson is sponsoring for MLG this coming season. We have, as always, Spike Mouth with us. What Halo Reach player is going to be sponsored by Sony Ericsson this coming season for MLG? Well, along with Sony Ericsson announcing that David Walsh, who is known as Walshy, and Andy Dunsky, which is Bravo, getting the sponsorship through Sony Ericsson. They actually came out today and announced that T-Squared, the one and only, will be also sponsored along with the two others. A pretty big deal. You know, three top known people in the Halo community are being sponsored by Sony Ericsson. And uh, they're definitely going to make a statement this year from the Halo community. Uh, I was able to hang out with Bravo during PAX East and the way he promoted products and stuff like that. I mean, the way they're going to promote is just going to be ridiculous. Well, what you said, Justin, is exactly what I hope happens. I mean, one thing that competitive gamers are going to have to do is they're going to have to get behind those companies who support competitive gaming. And to be honest, I think a lot of gamers tend to be pretty particular when they choose their products. But if we want to see competitive gaming grow, we absolutely have to support those sponsors who make a difference. And Sony Ericsson has definitely come forward. I mean, Sony as a whole has done a lot of things this year, and I'm sure we're going to hear more about that from Sundance. Thanks for that quick update on Halo. Finally, Relent, talk to me about Call of Duty. I heard Motivation did something good this week. Yeah, the 360 Icons hosted their first PS3 um, 4v4 MLG tournament, and Motivation walked away with the win. Very proud of them. Shoutouts to all of them. Jagonometry, P90, Temp, Clover, they all did a fantastic job. There's a video out of their amazing comeback when they were down 75 points to uh, take the win in the final map. Good job to all of them, and congrats. I really think motivation is peaking at just the right time, and I'm very optimistic for this team. So I want you to send out a big shout-out to all of them and tell them we're really going to be uh, really going to be expecting great things from them. I mean, no matter what, they've been fantastic, but I really hope all works out. And thank you so much for being the manager that you've been. Thank you, Relent. No problem. I love this community, and I love working for it. All right, I'd like to introduce you to our special guest for this 60th episode of The Loser's Bracket. Honestly, the man needs no introduction. You all know who he is. The CEO of MLG, Sundance Giovanni. Sir, I'd like to welcome you back to the show. It's been a while. How have you been since the last time you were here on The Loser's Bracket? Uh, busy, busy, very busy. But uh, thanks for having me back. I'm excited to get into this been prepping for Dallas, uh, so glad I had some time to talk to you before we get down there. Thank you so much for being on the show. One week out, Sonny, and uh, you ready? Oh, God, I'd be lying if I said I was 100% ready. I think we're close. We've got a lot going on. There's obviously a lot of new stuff being rolled out that people are going to be seeing for the first time from us. But, uh, yeah, we're good. It's just I, I, I always get a little nervous going into the first event because we get the break and everything. But I think Adam and those guys, you know, claps all set. The league guys are set. But uh, I'm excited to get down there. I fly down on Tuesday for some meetings ahead of the event. And I just uh, I want to see it just like all the fans do. Yeah, well, I'm sure that uh, nobody is going to be a stranger to uh, 
hearing that five o'clock opening, knowing that the season has begun again, I think uh, I think that's the moment when uh, you know it's all coming together. Let's start out with some of the changes this year. We're a week away. I'm sure for Dallas, you've got all the uh, the big changes uh, probably in place. You know what you can and cannot do. Um, so for those who you know were frequent uh, frequent uh, flyers with MLG last year. What will they see in Dallas this year that's going to right off the bat say, wow, this is different, this is awesome? Well, I, you know, I, like we said, we're trying to do things a little bit differently, and we've been accused in the past of being a Halo league that had other games going on, and that was you know, more or less kind of true. We, we always focused on Halo, and the experience for Halo was that main stage experience, and playing on that stage was what you know Halo players strive to do. So now, right out of the gate, walking in, you're going to notice that there are three main stage areas. Uh, you know, one dedicated to StarCraft, one dedicated to Black Ops, and one dedicated to Halo. Those stages will be pretty much the same in layout in terms of the amount of uh, floor space taken. You know, the projection experience isn't going to be the same for all of them, but but that's based on game, you know, the in-game experience and what we're going to be able to do from a theater mode. But, you know, the idea this year, the kind of the word is balance. We're investing in each of these equally and and we want the you know fans of starcraft and fans of black ops or fans of any other game that makes it on the circuit to feel like their game is on the circuit and it's at the same level as uh, as halo um so that's going to be the first thing that everybody's going to notice let's talk a little bit about the news that came out just <clears throat> at the beginning of the week sony erickson and then tlo from team liquid so obviously major league gaming and your sponsors are putting your money where your mouth is StarCraft II player already sponsored at the beginning of the season. Helps some of the uh, StarCraft community understand uh, what went into why TLO and uh, what this means, what they should expect. Will there be more sponsorships coming out? Give us the, give the StarCraft community a little bit of backdrop on that. All right. So, you know, as, as we've been saying, you know, we're, we're making efforts to move that those sponsor deals around a bit. You know, it's not just going to be the Halo guys. You're going to see there's a, some Black Ops players as well who are looking to be sponsored, and um, more StarCraft players who are in the queue to get a look. At, you know, the idea here is that um, we've seen, and, and this is a, there's a little, little bit of a downside to this whole thing, in that there's been some difficulty around the team sponsorship model because, you know, a lot of brands aren't really seeing the value out of all four guys. Or, but so what we're trying to do is mix it back up a little bit and, and give them some personalities across different games. Believe it or not, a lot of people don't understand that we don't just say, okay, we want to take your money and apply it to player X, right? Um, we in the beginning put a lot of time and effort into building the brands of players like Walshy and and a T squared, who's also got to deal with these guys. Uh, um, you know, and a karma, let's say, but it's gotten to the point now where you can Google these guys, you can kind of, you know, these brands are smart enough that they're able to take a measure of, of how popular these people are. So we present names and kind of give a resume and a background drop and a link to some of their social media efforts. And then the brands will then choose the players that they want. So, uh, you know, this deal came out of us, you know, presenting a bunch of players and basically saying, you know, here are the basic guys who are out there that we're thinking of packaging up and here's who they're affiliated with. And, you know, the brand made the decision. They're the ones who finalize on it. So on the, as far as StarCraft goes, you're going to see a few more names sponsored. Hopefully, you know, so there's, there's a few more things in the works that are going to be coming out. Uh, I think a few of them will be pretty surprising just in terms of who the brands are and, how, you know, and, and what's going to be the focus of those sponsorships. But as I said, when I came and spoke to you for the first time I spoke to you and all the times we've chatted since then, my goal as CEO is to balance things out, is to spread these, this around a little bit. So, you know, and, and we've got a few initiatives in place that we're going to be launching for the players, you know, talk, you know, around Dallas and at Dallas, which is just going to take that even further. So I'm really excited about this. And I'll be honest with you, Sony Erickson is a tremendous partner. And some of the things they have planned for these players, is just, uh, it's just amazing. So, you know, we got a lot of work to do to get to where I want to be. And I know that a lot of the players are, you know, asking where those sponsorships are and where those deals are, but we're getting there. And we're also opening up some of the restrictions around the sponsorships that players are allowed to get for themselves. Uh, and allocating space on the jersey for existing sponsors. And, you know, it, this is the movement towards an open league for the players, you know, as much as possible. Obviously, there's going to be some blockage based on brands that are baked into the pro circuit. But, you know, the Sony Erickson thing is great. And, you know, we've got a few more tricks up our sleeve in terms of announcements to come out. But um, I'm expecting you're going to see quite a few more players uh, represent some of the different partner brands uh, over the course of this year. When you go through and you make this decision, Obviously, 
the online presence, which I want to stress right now to everyone listening, uh, because a lot of times I get asked by players, why is social media important? And you're almost answering that question better than I could by telling them exactly what happens. You present players that you know have a brand that you believe is marketable and that you obviously are comfortable supporting by making that recommendation. And then the brands themselves, the sponsors, they make the final decision and they're using the Internet to find out who these players are and what appears to be their online presence. Is that correct? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, you know, I can't stress this enough. You know, we can talk about what's what's going on with with Epic Games as an example of that. That that was motivated by a lot of movement on Twitter, right? So, a very simple Google search, you know, a historical check of what somebody's patterns and posts have been about uh, on some of these social media sites, and you know, and if all you're doing up there is you know shit talking and asking for you know free streams to UFC fights, you're not going to get a sponsorship. I'll tell you right now, you're just not. So I, we try and preach to folks, you know, be wary of this, be an ambassador. You know, a lot of the things, Jerry, that I know you do with, with your community, you know, it's important because collectively as a whole, so let's say, okay, so the top players, it's obvious, right? But then what about the next tier, you know, the people who maybe aren't in the top eight, but who will be next year or, or are shooting to be next year, right? You guys are collectively have so much more power if you're aligned and if you're pushing the same direction. That's why when you see these little flame wars that pop up and stuff, it, it's just damaging in general because it de- devalues the entire community when I, when we're out there talking about it you know it being a, a valuable spend for a brand remember these brands the reason they want to do this is because they want to take somebody who can be a, a spokesperson an evangelist and they want to empower them and create a, a certain aspirational value it's tough to be that person you know if you're not weary of what you're saying of of your brand as a person as a player or a team i'm not saying don't have fun don't talk with your friends i mean look i i've been accused of you know using twitter you know, I, I drive some people nuts within the, you know, MLG, within the company in terms of how I use Twitter, like retweeting things maybe that got out as, you know, were an error or were posted too soon or, you know, poking fun at stuff. But all of that should really encompass who you are and what you're about. But understand that underneath this lens of, of, of being looked at and being viewed, we're being judged based upon our communication with one another and our broadcasting to the world through these networks. So, you know, these players, uh, a lot of them, you know, there are some folks that we've had to go to and say, hey, maybe you want to turn this down. Or, you know, we're, we're working on these things. And I think people get it once you present it. But, but my hope is that more and more folks within the community are self-starters and, and, and take the initiative on this stuff. Because, you know, there's a tremendous amount of power. You may say, well, I've only got 1,000 followers or I've got 500 followers, right? Well, imagine you take all of the 500 of those people and they're all pushing in the same direction as your core message. Suddenly, that's incredibly compelling because you know how it works. It basically, you know, you put your message at the top and this pyramid builds out underneath it. And suddenly you've got thousands and thousands and thousands of people. That's not lost on these brands. And this is the new world. This is a world where that is much more tactile, much more uh, important to them than, let's say, just a traditional media spend because it has a life and lives on afterwards. So I know it's a long-winded answer, but, but I think the point is it's just I, I really want to encourage everyone to be thoughtful about the, how they communicate. If you're going to have, you know, some of these arguments you, you, you see pop up, try and take that behind closed doors because what we're trying to do is present the, the value of the community as a whole. Now, these guys that you're seeing get sponsored. They represent the highest level of achievement for true competition, but the rest of the community has a tremendous amount of value as well, and, and uh, especially for the, the players who are out there trying to build a brand for themselves. Just be conscious of it. I mean, you can look at professional sports and you can you can immediately think of people who do a good job of it and people who don't. It's it's something that you just have to be conscious about and respectful. I think essentially what you want to do is you, you, you want to, you know, adhere to the same basic principles and philosophies you do in life, right? Try to be positive, push things forward, handle your business, you know, <laughs> quietly, but but in a very firm way and always be thinking about where you're headed. And, and if you can do those things through social media, you're only going to help yourself and help our efforts. I think that's that echoes everything that, you know, uh, as you mentioned, we try to do in VV Gaming with a lot of our players. And, you know, often I think it runs into two barriers. And I think the first one often is what you've highlighted is that the early adapters who use social media has been social, and now they have to apply a business lens to a natural tool or at least a professional lens and ask themselves, you know, how will people judge me based on my Facebook and my 
Twitter feed and what I'm saying. Uh, the second one sometimes, uh, and I think you're hinting at this, is the value of collective numbers. Um, I believe a lot of times what happens is that players get caught up in their own brand, that, you know, I am this brand. But they also, the brand doesn't really have any weight unless it exists in an industry. So, for example, you know, Coca-Cola really wouldn't be Coca-Cola if there wasn't a soft drink industry. McDonald's is no McDonald's and there isn't a fast food industry. So, you know, every brand has its position. Like, yes, I am Walsh or T-squared, but obviously they're not there just for Walsh and T-squared because there is no Walsh and T-squared unless there is a competitive gaming uh, environment, landscape, industry that's, that's happening around them. And I think sometimes players forget that connection. I think you're right. And, like, you know, you... <laughs> I, I'm aware of the fact that, you know, the MLG in, in the past has had, you know, it's, it's fans and also some detractors and, you know, and, and, and rightfully so. But the point is, is that if we're all in this, you know, competitive gaming company, you know, world together and we're, on, we're, we're in this boat together, right? And we're, we're, we're trying to get to the, a point of realization. The realization is that competitive sports are at, at a level in the United States that, you know, it's solidified, there's a structure that's in place, and it's not going anywhere. You know, w w what we need to do is be aware of that, that the thought leaders, the people who are the influencers, you know, more often than not are going to be, are going to have to be thinking about how they're rallying around some specific ideas. I'm in no way, shape, or form saying that my goal is I want to monopolize competitive gaming in the United States or globally through major league gaming. What I'm saying is that I want the community, guys like you, Jerry, who've reached out and basically, you know, the reason we were talking is because you criticized us and you kept trying to keep us honest. And finally, you know, I reached out to you through Twitter and we talked and we said, holy shit, we've got a lot in common. We should actually sit down. Maybe we can, maybe we can, you know, dispel some of the, the misconceptions. I think the biggest key to it all is, is kind of reaching out and looking for the similarities rather than putting up walls and barriers, right? Because there's going to be other people who are going to have leagues and there are going to be other people who are going to try and do competitive gaming and I, i'm fine with that so long as i'm listening to the community and i'm doing the best job possible my organization is doing the best job possible and the way that's going to happen is is if the community can kind of you know cut through a lot of the bs and keep things focused and keep things honest but also evolve with us you know this year is i i think this is really the year of social media and social networking and kind of you know socializing the content in a way, a way unlike anything we've ever seen before around competitive gaming in the united states so it's going to be, you know, the experience around the live stream, around the events, and just around the way we're going to be using social media and kind of activating the audience and the fan base, both in the room and in, on the streams and the players, um, is, is going to be a whole different level. Now, the, the reason that's so compelling is it makes it so portable. It makes the experience something that people can share in their own terms, in their own ways. And this really does come back to that whole idea of, you know, we're all part of an industry really, you know, it's not just video games. This is, this is video game as sport. So, you know, the way we behave is going to, you know, a lot of those barriers that we used to see in terms of people saying, Oh, those guys are assholes or that, you know, they've got so much attitude online. That stuff is, is starting to melt away in a major way, major way. Eight years ago, when this league started, there were a bunch of five-year-old kids who had never heard of professional gaming. Those kids are now 13. You know, and right now there's a whole new group of five, eight year old kids who in five years are going to grow up be at a point where they're teenagers. And in their point of view of the universe, the NFL, Major League Baseball, National Hockey League and Major League Gaming are all professional leagues that are comparable. That's if we continue to do our job. So it's just, you know, it's incredibly important that we, again, and I, I'm not, I'm not trying to say that Major League Gaming is the only game in town, but it's important that we understand that what we're all trying to build and we're all trying to um, nurture requires us to be you know, aware of that. That's bigger than all of us, I guess, is, is my long-winded point that I'm trying to get to. And so it's as much about those players who don't, we don't know yet as the Walshies, the Tilos, the Idras, the Hucks, you name, you know, the Hastros, you name it. That's the key. The audience is where the power truly lies. Those players are the very, very fortunate members of that audience who've risen to the top and become stars. But without the audience, this doesn't matter. And without the structure, this is incredibly hard to keep alive. You know, you can't say that enough. I, I often tell, and, you know, even sometimes members of the VB community get criticized because they're very outspoken. And I always remind them, if you're a fan of competitive gaming, get out there, be respectful, but voice your opinion. Tell the world that you care and are involved about this, or, you know, that you're involved in this. 
do it respectfully and uh, more good things will follow. Talking about more good things following, I want to talk a little bit more about the structure of the events and I want to talk a little bit sort of it kind of title by title, but let's start sort of uh, generally with the idea of throwback events. Now, obviously Dallas is the first one. I'm not saying this one, you know, as you mentioned, there's a long break and I think the last thing you need is also the, the throwback events. So let's not, we, we shouldn't expect anything at Dallas is, is my point. Is that correct? Yeah, you're right. Uh, you know, I think maybe you and I spoke to this point. Uh, coming out of the gate, a long break with the change in the broadcast structure, the change in the event structure, we need to get the first event under our belt. You know, we're looking to to have these throwbacks come into play, you know, later in the season. I feel good about, you know, some of the things that, that we could do around a game, you know, like Gears of War, uh, around, you know, the Smash world. It's going to take a little while to get there, but this first event, again, you know, there's going to be no lack of stuff going on, and, and you know, the new structure is really exciting. But if we had added a throwback to this, I think it would have tipped over the apple cart. You know, I think it just would have been one more thing, new thing to have to, you know, get through that weekend. I just couldn't, I couldn't, I wouldn't be feeling as good about the event as I do now if if, if I had okayed that for this event. Also, okay, then let's talk. You mentioned gears. You mentioned brawl. Why don't we start with brawl? If I were a brawler, and obviously, you know, I think everybody's going to be trying to do the math. You know, here's Columbus, here's Anaheim. Well, Gears and Rally probably go side by side. Providence is the finals. Do you see Brawl as something more as a one-off in an event, or you want to have some sort of structural to do an invite for finals, or is it all up in the air, and is there anything you need from the Brawl community to help make that decision? Well, the good news is that, you know, nothing's written in stone other than that schedule, which got got out there somehow. I, again, I don't know how it got leaked, but uh, we've been trying to get the, that out there for, for months. And there was, the Anaheim event was holding it up. And that's why when I saw that IMG, you know, leaked it, I, I, I posted to it. But anyway, so I think what we've got is a couple of different, you know, potential strategies around it. One would be having a couple of throwback titles that we cycle or, you know, or doing multiple throwback titles on an event weekend, depending on where the event is. Um, and a final one would be working with some of the grassroots organizations, obviously around Smash, you know, the brawl community is, is out there still and trying to do an invite thing. I, we've, we've got to work with the folks. We've got to look at kind of the, you know, the calendars for the year at some of these other events that are out there. Luckily, we've got one of the big um, players in the Smash community working into you know, the, moving into the New York office basically to help us with some other stuff. So, you know, it, it, it's going to be important to have him there locally. So, you know, he's thinking about it. So, you know, all I can tell you right now is that we've got a list of games on, on one of our whiteboards and with event names and dates. And, you know, the thinking is, is that we'll, we'll, we'll be closer to having some plans coming out of Dallas. And I'd like to get that stuff resolved as closely to, you know, as close to the at close of Dallas as possible. Well, I'm going to bring on board uh, Dakota Lasky, who's known as VV Rapture. He's actually the host of our Directional Influence podcast. Dakota, welcome to the show. Hey, what's up, everybody? So, Dakota, this is uh, you are the man, the one with all of the brawl information. I want to give you an opportunity to ask uh, Sundance any questions you might have that you've heard from the brawl community. All right, cool. So, yeah, I've I've actually got like, quite a few from some people. So the the most general one is, assuming there is a throwback for it, which we can obviously assume that there is, will it be only Brawl or Brawl and Melee? I, I would want to see what the community felt like would be the best best event, best experience. I mean, we've got the capability of doing both. You know, I'm a big believer in trying to give the fans what they want. So, you know, I think we'll – We'll put that out there with some ample time. Maybe we'll do some voting on Smashboards or we'll, you know, we'll present a few options based on what the schedule and equipment load would look like that we think we can do effectively and just ask people, I mean, do we want, you know, a lot of team activity or 2v2? Do we want, you know, what, what do we want uh, as a community, you know, as a Smash community? And then assuming that I can float it and, and make it work from a schedule standpoint and fund it, we'll do it. But again, I want to try and work hand in hand with some of the, you know, the, the grassroots community stuff that's going on now, and and we'll have a better handle on that following Dallas. Basically, I'm looking to you guys to let me know what you'd really like to see. Yeah, definitely. We're all like waiting to hear about it, and <laughs> uh, you know, definitely we were, I mean, we want to work with it because you know a lot of us feel like you know after the you know, the thing that happened at DC and Dallas and all that, you know, really wasn't a great reflection of our community. 
So besides that, uh, one of the things that a lot of us actually I not had a problem with, but I guess had a problem with was at Orlando, which was the first event, it was random seating. And uh, I mean, the community is known for keeping rankings and which we use for seedings in our own tournaments. Uh, why is it that you guys went with random seeding and will you do the same for a throwback event? Well, first off, I just want to touch on something you said just for a second. So, you know, in terms of what happened with Dallas and kind of the, um, you know, obviously I meant what I said when, uh, you know, I went out and I said to the community, like, look, we were put in a tough position. That whole thing was unfortunate, but I have a tremendous respect and I, you know, I like uh, the brawl community a lot. We've had, we've got a, a long history with you guys and we haven't always gotten it right. We tried you know, if you go back to our original TV show, Ken and Isaiah were in our, in our TV show on USA Network. I mean, we, we really were trying to get this out there in a big, big way. But I can also admit that we didn't do it right all the time. So one of the things we will try and address is things like, uh, the, like I said, the seating issue. Historically, the way MLG has operated, because we are a circuit, you know, league, whatever that you want to call us, but really what we're trying to do is we're trying to be a, to a certain extent, a closed universe. So what you do with us matters more than what you do elsewhere. That doesn't necessarily work if you're going to try and embrace an open and very competitive and, and self-monitoring community. So my guess would be that, you know, and this is one of the conversations I've had with the league guys, is that we would look at doing something based off of those. We wouldn't try and randomize things. Again, I, I'm getting ahead of myself because, the, the, you know, this will be six people on a conference call talking through it, trying to make sure we get it right. But we'll do better, is all I can tell you. We'll definitely try and make something that makes sense to everybody and where there's it's all upside and nobody's coming away from it saying like, ah, you know what, that was mostly good, except for this one thing that really didn't sit well with us. Of course, you're always going to have people who feel like something wasn't done right, but we're going to listen to the community going into any of these throwback events. All right, cool. That's actually really awesome. Glad to hear about that. And finally, obviously, one of the biggest things last year was the fact that Nintendo didn't support you guys at all. And obviously, that means we didn't have a live stream. Would you guys consider having like an audio stream that was just like commentators talking? So at least we have more than a live blog, or is that like not a possibility? Um, again, it comes down to schedule. I think you know what. You know, it's a different it's a different era over here. I've 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 got a slightly different approach to dealing with partners like Nintendo than the previous guy did. You know, and I've got a slightly better personal relationship with folks over there. So, my goal would be to get you guys our broadcast. You know, and get some people up there who know about the game talking about it, just like we're doing with everything else. Uh, if I couldn't do that, then uh, radio sounds good. You know, radio on the internet works. So. <laughs> um, it is uh, it is something that I've thought about, and it's something that we've we've talked about internally. So, again, what it, you know, inevitably, what it comes down to is is do we get the support? Do we get the rights to do it? Because I can't put a broadcast up there and then get sued for not having rights. All right, cool. Thank you. Um, that's actually really what I was looking to hear. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Well, Dakota, thank you so much for taking time to be on the show, and uh, appreciate you always bringing us the best brawl information on uh, directional influence. So thank you so much, Dakota. Yep, always. All right. Well, if we're going to talk about one-offs, why don't we go to the rhythm gaming genre next? And I know, Paradise, you, Jason, had some questions, and I know you put the big threat up on Score Hero. So uh, go ahead. Take the floor. Most definitely. So, Sundance, by now, I'm sure you've seen the thread that we've created over on ScoreHero.com's forums. Basically, I actually got together with a couple other of the big competitive gamers in the rhythm gaming slash guitar hero field, and we put together a set of rules for a hypothetical MLG event. One of my biggest questions is, what are your thoughts? What is the MLG feedback to the thread that we have put together? I'd love to hear your current mindset. Well, I was surprised, honestly. I mean, not surprised, but I love initiative. I love people who are self-starters, I'll tell you that. And, and we've talked about this. You know, We've had an exchange around this category in the past. And I like it. I think it's an incredibly you know, entertaining category. I think... The challenges for us come into just what's happening in the the industry around them, the the games a little bit. But however, having said that, I think I circulated that within the office and got a, a, a very positive response to it um, from people saying, you know, this is be great content. This would really plug into our IMG deal really well. You could take this and put it on TV all over the world. People will just get it. 
So, you know, I don't have any, you know, I know I'm sure you'd love to hear me say it's penciled in for one of our stops. I can't go that far, but what I can tell you is that it's up on that whiteboard and it's it's got lines drawn to a couple of the stops. And we've got some folks coming to Dallas who could potentially help make it happen. Uh, we, we're, we're working on it. And I think seeing the support and, you know, we might need to, you know, get a little bit more verbal and vocal out there, um, you know, as, as a community to kind of draw some attention to it from some key people. But the good news is, is that, um, it, the, the idea is alive and kicking and, you know, we've seen that it can be done well and it can be made entertaining. Other, you know, other tournament organizers have done a really good job with it in the past. We did it at e for all with target way back when we were out there doing the e for all show and the year that was in existence. So, you know, I, I would love to, to pull something together. I'd, I'd also love to, honestly, I think with what we're trying to do um, from a content standpoint, I'd love to create kind of a weekly show around rhythm gaming, competitive rhythm gaming, and, and get people doing it more within our universe. It's, it's something that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be looking for help on once we get into the, the summer months. I got to admit, that's really cool to hear. I'm sure you just made a lot of rhythm gamers' hearts jump a beat, uh, skip a beat even, you know. That was, uh, that's pretty cool to hear. To give a little bit of a follow-up, me personally, I would love to see Guitar Hero Warriors of Rock just because it's the most competitive of the games. But I know there's always, of course, the entertainment side as well, and a lot of tournaments in the past have held entertainment-based. Um, some some things that come to mind, some things like the WSVG, Freddie Wong, those events where they had celebrities come in and do judging. Me personally, I'd love to see a much more competitive environment, but would you like to see something entertainment-based as well? Kind of like how we have in the past for Brawl, we had singles and doubles, or for Tekken, how we had singles and then 3v3. Would you potentially look into doing a competitive as well as an entertainment-based rhythm gaming event? Or what are your thoughts on that? Well, I think, you know, one the, the challenge is, is that at the end of the day, if I can create something that people are going to you know, maybe they bump into it in one of our stream broadcasts or, or people see it in the room for the first time. They're just like, wow, blown away by it. That's obviously a win. So I, it's a balancing act. What I don't want to do is I don't want to throw the competitive component out the window, obviously, for the just you know for entertainment's sake. But professional leagues are, are forced to make adjustments all the time. The NHA, NHL changed, uh, changed the size of the net, the three-point line, um, zone defenses that were added to the NBA, the TV timeout in the NFL. You know, I, I think it's a balance of com- competition and entertainment are crucial. But again, I'm going to have to lean on you guys to a certain degree of when, you know, if and when we get to that point to let me know how much of a blend is acceptable, right? Because at the end of the day, we have to create a compelling entertainment product, uh, not just for the hardcore guys, but also for a broader audience. So again, I'll look to you guys to keep me, uh, keep me honest and, and, and we'll see where we land. I think, you know, at the end of the day, it's, um, it's got to be a bit of both, but, but I'm never comfortable throwing the, you know, the competitive foundation under the bus you know, in order to create an entertaining product, but, but sometimes you have to be flexible. I agree 100%. So final question in regards to rhythm gaming. If you could give the rhythm gamers that are listening to this show right now a little bit of a heads up, any direction on which game you might be leading with, if an event does happen, would be be looking towards Warriors of Rock Guitar Hero, would be looking towards Rock Band, potentially DJ Hero, any sort of way that you could give us a little sneak peek if something happens? Uh, <laughs> well, I think from a, you know, from a relationship standpoint, very strong with, and this is a good thing, I'm very strong with the folks behind both Rock Band and, and Guitar Hero and DJ Hero. So I think what we'll do is we'll we'll work with the community to identify um and the hero franchise honestly gives us a little bit more flexibility which i think is a good thing but uh what i'll do is i will promise you this before we make any official announcement or decision there uh you'll be one of the people i reach out to to say hey this is what we're thinking let's go see what the you know the broader community thinks about it unless i'm painted into a corner where one of the other comes in and says here here's money here's this here's that we'll, we'll do it that way but, you know, I, I, my goal, again, is to get the best representation of what competitive rhythm gaming can be, both from a, a competition standpoint, but also an entertainment standpoint, bundled up and, and presented. 
I would love, love, love to do it. And, you know, I've been talking with people, it, it may sound crazy, but we've been talking with brands about it. Like, you know, folks at Gibson, folks in the music business, the you know, music industry, um, there's lots of DJs, uh, there's a music component of some of the things we're working on. So, you know, it, it, it may not be as soon as you'd like, but it is something that's on my list of to-do items. And it's on, you know, when I make my, my track cross country, I generally have one or two meetings that are related to it. So exciting to hear. Sundance, thank you so much for the information. I have my fingers crossed that we get some more information soon, but uh, in the meantime, we are all very appreciative of what you have told us. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Yeah, Sundance, thank you for doing that. Let's move on to Call of Duty. And in the course of coming to Call of Duty, uh, we've got Sony. We have this big sponsor. And I get this feeling that, and I could be wrong, this is the place where If you are a Call of Duty player right now, listen very carefully because new sponsors like home runs. And I'm guessing that the more people that play, support, and do things for Call of Duty, a lot better it is for you. Where is Call of Duty right now? What more do you need? And what we need through the season? Because I'll tell you what, we'll come to Gears of War. I know we're talking about one-offs. But the Gears of War community, I think, learned a lot of things in their first season. And I'd love to see the Call of Duty community maybe not make some of the mistakes that the Gears community made in the early days. What do you need from them? Because even though they're on the circuit, as the Gears community found out, easy cometh, easy goeth. What do you think, Sonny? Uh, yeah, I mean, you know, I, I, I think there we got a lot of people saying um, – Hey, you know, why is it on this platform? What is it doing? Well, remember, up until this year, it was an online you know, activity. We finally got to a point where we were able to bring it in. So um, I think, and you know, with this first event, honestly, there were some hitches in getting the announcement out. Um, and when that happened, one of the things that I kind of, you know, I went to the Activision folks and the Sony folks and said, look, you know, the turnout for this first one is probably not going to be what it's going to be for Columbus, but that's on us. So the community gets a pass on the first event, not being a sellout or being a smashing success. Having said that, I'm expecting a hundred teams, you know, we'll sell out a halo and we'll sell out a Starcraft. You know, that's 256 team bracket and a 256 person competition bracket. Yeah. You know, we've got that capacity. We can run that capacity on the black ops side. Will we hit that in the first event? No. Will we hit it by the end of the year? I, I hope so. And, and for the people who say, well, I play on Xbox, you know what? I, my only response is, well, all the top players from Xbox have migrated over. If you're broke, I get that. You know what? I can I can make suggestions in terms of you know how to address that. But the reality is, is that I couldn't put three hundred fifty thousand dollars worth of prize money towards it. I couldn't broadcast it. I couldn't. Could I? Could I, Sundance? I have to interrupt you here. You know, I've heard that argument too from players who've come to me and, and said this. You know, I keep thinking to myself. You have a friend's house, you have local land centers, you have a lot of things, and we have to support those companies, brands that are willing to put money behind this. And from what you're saying, Sony's been very generous. How do you say no to that, to be honest? Well, you don't. (laughs) Is the answer you don't. I mean, look, all relevant parties are aligned around this, meaning we've got Activision coming to Dallas, we've got Sony there making a, a, a big commitment, multi-year commitment potentially. You know, it's up to us. It's up to the community. You know, my point is, is that without flexibility, you know, without the understanding, look, if, we're, if we were five years down the line, right, and let's say there's a 120 kids who are making baseline salaries of 40 to 60 grand just playing games here in this country, you know, across our, our circuit or just in competitive gaming in general. And one season I came out and I said, guess what? Last year we ran it this way on this hardware and this year we'll change it to that hardware. I get it. You can be upset because that's what you're changing the playing field. Basically, you know, you're, you're, you're altering the the core fundamentals of the game. We're trying to establish a multi-title league with balance in terms of the amount of prize money, the amount of you know sponsorship opportunities, the revenue opportunity for players. The way to do that is to follow the money, right? And again, this has been an investment. The last it's been eight years now where we've invested capital in, in building this thing up. Our partners now are investing more and more capital in the infrastructure, meaning and this I can't stress this enough, for the first time ever, I have somebody, a partner, 
investing directly into prize money. Because guess what? As a brand, whether you're a consumer package good or you're a media business or you're a video game brand, when someone comes along and says, I need hundreds of thousands of dollars for prize money, that brand typically looks at it and says, okay, that's great. I'll pay for the impressions online. I'll pay for the activation. I'll, I'll give you gear. I'll pay for anything but that. You've got to, you've got to front that yourselves. And you know what you say right there is what I think gamers themselves are guilty about. When we first started in VV Gaming, I was under the impression that everybody that was doing what VV Gaming does was getting all this money from all these sponsors because that was the sort of running game. And don't get me wrong, there have been companies that have established you know, relations on the PC side that have gotten money from companies. But I feel like so many young people, if they could be educated to how difficult it is to get a major brand like Sony or even a brand like Hot Pockets or Dr. Pepper, these are, compared to competitive gaming, something that you know, are mainstream brands that the, the general population is familiar with. And you're obviously going to be asked to deliver results for them. They're not giving you money out of generosity. It always seems to me that a lot of players, especially when it comes to the 360 question, when they're focused on their world, and I get that. I get that's part of being young. I get, um, But reinforcing the idea that, look, we really need you to trust and support what's trying to be done here that would help a lot. And then obviously taking the next step and, and maybe going so forward as to help promote those sponsors, which brings me to the Sony question again. We have Sony Ericsson. That's a product, a brand of Sony's. We have Sony obviously investing money in Call of Duty. And now that you've mentioned potentially multi-year, and I know you can't say a lot about this, but multi-year Call of Duty multi-year possible other Sony titles or multi-year possible other titles on the Sony platform, all of the above, what would that entail? Well, I, you know, it's all of the above. I mean, you know, obviously we want to build the success around Call of Duty for them. You know, one of the things that people don't realize is that of the you know, 14, 15 million copies that were sold by the game, you know, they're not lagging that far behind the Xbox platform. But again, you know, if, Call of Duty doesn't work for some reason, which I can't imagine that it won't. You know, we would we would move to Plan B. Plan B could be to go back and you know go back to fighting, maybe with Capcom or look at Mortal Kombat or look at you know maybe by then who knows the next Ocom could come out and could be you know a resurgence of that game. But I'm a big believer in the fact that you know we've been working with this with this IP, meaning you know the intellectual property that is Call of Duty. We've been working with it for a while. We've been working with both Infinity Ward and Treyarch and Activision to try and build it up. We're at, finally at a point where the stars have aligned and we've got, lo and behold, Treyarch patching the game for us, Activision actively working with us, Sony promoting and, and investing. It doesn't take a rocket scientist to look and to say, wow, that's a lot of support. Maybe I should just say, you know what? This is as good as it could possibly be right now. And if I could, you know, if I continue to work at it, it can get better. And maybe it'll turn into something else. Maybe it'll get bigger than Halo on the competitive scene. Maybe it'll eclipse StarCraft. We don't know. Who knows? That's up to the community. It's really up to the community. There are more people playing this game at any given moment online than playing World of Warcraft. Think about that. The numbers are insanity. But what we've got to do is we're starting, we're, we're at like level two, you know, there. We're already at level five with StarCraft, and we're at level eight with Halo, but we're at level two with this. So this first event is really, it's going to be us proving the concept on the ground, investing a lot of money in it, need the community to promote it, need the community, rather than posting Sundance as a sellout, MLG sucks, it's all about money. I, I'm not pocketing that money. That's going straight to the community. That's the other thing you know, that drives me nuts sometimes that people don't get. It. This is a subsidizing the activity. Sony's investment is subsidizing an activity which costs a lot of money. They're not paying 100%. It's not a 100% subsidy. It's a percentage subsidy. I'm investing the rest of the money. MLG, we have decided to invest in this community because it's huge and because there's a lot of upside to it. So for all those folks who have a sense of entitlement, who get upset, or, or, or who don't understand it, to your point, it's just how about this? How about you just look at the history? Look at what's happened to other competitive games and how they haven't worked out. Even though, you know, Gears of War 2 was going to be the biggest thing in the planet for us. It was going to be huge. 
it didn't work for so many reasons. And you know what? A big part of it was that the community just did not stick with it, honestly. You know, I mean, the game wasn't great, but you know what? It was, you could throw it up on a screen. It was pretty entertaining to watch to somebody who didn't get the, the, the core mechanics. I've got to jump in there. You know, this is something that I remember when Gears of War 2 was released, and I, you know, a lot of people, you know, I could rally VV Gaming behind it. That was what I had power in. In Europe, they were split. They were going to go back to Gears 1, and I kept shaking my head thinking, you can't do that. You, know, you try, and you try to reach out to community members who were leaders and say, you know, you may personally feel that Gears of War 1 is a better game, but that's not where the business is. And whenever somebody says what you just mentioned, oh, you know, it's, you're selling out. It's about the money. Well, we're adults. Maybe we have the privilege of working the business. Right you know what, though? So, but, but even on that front, you know what? I'm sorry. You know, whenever I hear that from a 17-year-old kid, or, and this is the great thing. It's the toys on the Internet. But whenever I'm at an event, an event, if I do a question and answer session where I'm sitting there talking to people, talking to fans, and someone asks me that directly, I ask them very simply. Do you have a car? Do you have a job? Do you get an allowance? Do, how, who buys your stuff? Right? Nine times out of ten, you know what the answer is? Parents, yes, I, of course. Yes, I have a car. Parents. No, I don't have a job. My parents buy my shit. Yeah. I'm like, talk to me in two years when you've got rent. It's a different world, Jerry. We know that. And that's fine. I mean, look, I get it. I love it. I'm just as you do. I, I am very passionate about this audience and empowering it. And and, and you know, you choose your you choose your lot in life, and this is mine. So you know, the vocal minority is going to get up all, all up in arms and, and and get up in our, our face about some of this stuff. But the reality is this: if Call of Duty does not work, just like if when Gears of War did not work out, the first person who points the finger towards me or Major League Gaming is going to just be the first in the line of ignorance, right? Because the reality is, I'm doing what I can. The brands that are supporting the effort are doing what they can. You, the players, the people who are listening to this, the people who play the game competitively, the people who just like the game, it's up to you to validate this, right? So, and how do you do that? You talk about it socially. You watch the events. You come to an event. You buy a spectator pass. You watch it on our VOD or watch the live stream. It's not, we're not asking you to make a huge investment in, in this other than your time, which you're already given to the game. So... And if you don't believe me, go talk to some folks that play Counter-Strike or Gears of War or the, the Brawl series, you know? It's not that difficult to see people who are in, you know, in the same position maybe a couple years ago or even longer than that who thought that their game was always going to be the best thing in the world and then suddenly it didn't line up. You can, the history of competitive gaming is littered with these mistakes that were made, with games like Painkiller, right, over, over, over Quake, or just certain things that just happen because it's a business, and I get that. We're not doing that. We're not selling our soul to be profitable and, and, and to get to a place where this business is going to live on. We're trying to do it with the community in mind, and in order for that to work, the community needs to validate the decisions we make. I'll, I'll just say this. We, we still play Halo CE, the original Halo in the office, 2v2. Why? Because from a purely competitive mechanical standpoint, that game is superior in several ways to Halo 2, Halo 3, and Halo Reach. However, from a mass audience programming and media and entertainment standpoint, the Halo franchise has gotten better and better with each revolution and iteration and innovation. And so that's why we run Halo Reach. It's pretty straightforward, you know, like it, it's, it's understanding that until we make our games and, and control our, our, our destiny in, in this universe by having control over what, what's being played on that competitive floor, it's up to us to make the best of what we got. And that means the community in some cases is saying, you know what, this is our chance. We have to grab it and go for it. Yeah, I mean, I think what you said can't, is, is <clears throat> one of those things that can't be, you know, I, I wish would never get lost. I wish that as soon as somebody's about to say, you know what? Uh, this is better, or I like this. It's, that you can say follow the money. I mean, there are a thousand pop culture references from music to movies to television shows where you've, for anyone listening to the show has heard follow the money. So, you know, we'll say it one more time, follow the money. As much as you may be a fan of, you know, it could be Halo CE or it could be any game, this is an industry that is forward thinking. It drives technology, it interacts with, Social media, it does all of these things that drive innovation. 
we have to move forward with it. And if we don't, if a title loses support, it then becomes that almost like a death nail because, and maybe this is a good time to segue to Gears of War, but I think the recent conversation started with Arctic's blog where he said, you know, we didn't see Gears of War 3 being likely. Someone pretended to be Cliffy B and responding to it. Cliffy B saw that, then he responded to it. And then, you know, there's a dialogue, which, you know, that that's really good. But I wanted to get a feel for, and I think what the Gears community needs to hear, something that you and I have talked about, but I, you know, I, I never talk about the things that we share in private. But one thing I would ask you to share a little bit is, you know, Cliffy B said that, he said two things that bothered me. And I'm going to be honest. The first thing he said was that the previous conversations with Major League Gaming were to change everything. And that first broad generalization, I thought, was was negative. And you need to move forward from here. And I don't you know, necessarily want you to say anything negative, but I'm going to say I didn't like that. The second thing I didn't like was his comment about how polarizing Major League Gaming was, that there was you know, people who loved it and people who hated it. From a marketing perspective, from a you know, I'm, I guess I'm a film snob. One of my favorite directors, <laughs> Stanley Kubrick, and I love Stanley. Exactly. Kubrick. Snob, you're a snob in a lot of areas, but it's almost just one of them. You know, it's one of the like... <laughs> I'll take that as a compliment. In some it's a huge, it takes huge, one to no one. It's a huge compliment, believe me. But you know, but but just on that last point, can you name a personality in the gaming universe who isn't paid to play and isn't paid to talk about games who polarizes more than Cliffy B? No, I mean, no. You know, I, mean I, think, I think I think I agree with you. I think that's why I found it so odd. I thought polarizing is good. I mean, you were on Jimmy Fallon. You said that you know you you you. It was kind of like it got leaked and then it got messed up. But I, I think to myself in the back of my head, polarizing is such a compliment. I mean, yeah. let me state for the record: I don't like Sarah Palin. Nothing about her. Right. But I can't escape her. She's polarizing, and there's a reason why people keep talking about her. If yeah, there are yeah. casual gamers who are upset at Major League Gaming or what they call the MLG players, that is something Epic, from a business, marketing, political standpoint, should be paying attention to. And I guess I don't understand why. And maybe it would help in this case, Sonny, for you to give a little bit of backstory of some of the challenges, you know, some of the things that make maybe Epic difficult to sway and i certainly don't think you asked them to change everything so if you could talk a little bit about that so you know it, 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 well here's what it comes down to is that you know cliffy cliffy wants to make his bonus the traditional thinking in the video game world is, is the way to make your bonus and, and to make a nice amount of money is sell a lot of games or come up with ip that's that's attractive enough that somebody will pay you a huge amount of money to get the exclusive on it Tens of millions of dollars, right? And to throw one more thing in there, obviously the engine. Well, yeah. Getting that engine, right? And Right. So Epic, a lot of people don't understand this. Epic makes video games, right? But what they're in the business of doing is licensing an engine. Okay. Thank you for sharing that because I I try again to share that with people. And I think they really need to understand, even Activision, right? You just don't make Call of Duty games. You make Call of Duty games to develop the engine. Um, Crisis 2 just released this week. It's that Crytek engine. You know, those, that's a huge part of this industry. It's soft. The software licensing business is one of the most lucrative businesses on the planet for a reason. Okay. And it's no different in video games. We could talk about that alone for hours and hours, but I think we'd probably bore everybody. But, the, but here's the point, right, Jerry? The point is this, is that Epic as a business, Unreal is the largest in, and it's the most obvious physical embodiment in terms of if you got a disc in your hand and the power of their engine, okay? And their games are built on the Unreal Engine, right? Even their mobile stuff that they do with Chair is built on the Unreal Engine. So I've been down to their studios. I've been to, uh, yeah, I've been to visit them in North Carolina. Been down there a few years ago. A lot of people don't realize they actually have a partnership in place with a CAA, Creative Artist Agencies, right? And so CAA manages actors and bands and you name it. And they've got you know they're, they're out there. They're getting you know endorsement deals for actors and and you know kind of. They're, they're, they're the guys, you know, like when you watch Entourage, Ari Gold, that's, that's, he's, you know, an agent, like a CAA agent, right? So they represent Epic, 
right? So Epic is in the business of taking what they've built around Unreal and, and Gears of War and these other brands and, and essentially, you know, making that bonus, right? So I have no problem with that. I get it. But so here's the issue is that when that business kind of diverges from what is needed in order for people to, you know, commun the community to get what they want and for innovation to happen, it's difficult. So when I went down there, the thing they wanted to talk about wasn't, they didn't want to talk about Gears as a comp competitive platform and working to get on the next game. They want to talk about a Gears of War movie or they want to talk about the next Unreal game because that's going to be the thing that everyone's going to license. So me sitting there and telling them that, you know, here's problem one with your engine, an unbelievable host advantage. You know, just the host advantage is, is just you can't get past it. They don't they don't want to hear that. They want to hear, well, the engine is amazing. It's the best out there. And it is a, it's an incredible piece of technology. So I don't I don't open with that. I don't walk into a room and, I'm, and say, here are the 19 things about your game that don't work for us. What I walk in is I say, look, I want to work with you to build the most passionate portion of the consumer base, right? You may identify them as a relatively small number, but guess what? They're the influencers. These two million people, uh, you know, influence tens of millions of people in terms of their purchase decision. And we own a big chunk of their their mind share. And by mind share, I mean their activity online and their the profile and the, you know what, what they're doing. So why don't we work together and figure out a way to make sure that your next game really aligns with that? Crickets. That's so understandable because it's a big leap. But here's the difference now. It's a few years later. Uh, I have access to 500 million international broadcast homes, meaning I can get on television in 500 million homes through IMG. I can get a billion eyeballs on the internet through my IMG relationship and some of the other distribution deals I have in place. Um, you know, competitive gaming is, is has such a huge resurgence thanks to StarCraft II and Black Ops is the most, you know, the highest selling game uh, in, in North America. So there's all this focus on, on what's happening in the space. So for Cliffy to message back and say, hey, you know, I'd love for ML, some of MLG to reach out, that's awesome. But again, that's a long way from us getting to a place where he fixes the two or three things that we need, like, you know, maybe... <laughs> Just, just it, again, I got three asks for Cliffy. I don't have 18. I don't want him to change everything. And not every kid who goes online with MLG and his gamer tag represents the league, uh, you know. And, and, but again, it polarizes people just like he does, just like his games do. I mean, Bulletstorm polarizes a lot of people's opinion of what a game is and what it should be. So we'll see. I, I, I'm hopeful. We're going to talk with those guys, uh, you know. I've met Mark Green. I've met all the guys at Epic and, 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 and had conversations with them in the past. And honestly... Uh, it was our decision to kind of move on and see, you know, if and when things came back around. And luckily, Cliffy's a fan of Twitter, and people are loud mouths on Twitter. So, so people got him to notice that people were talking about his game and MLG, and, and he reached out. Now, I think he's even on vacation, so for him to do that's great. But I'll let you guys know where it goes. Um, but I'm hopeful, and I will be in North Carolina meeting with the Convention and Visitors Bureau soon, talking about some of the stuff we're going to be doing around that event. So. Um, and, and we're meeting with some folks from Epic around that. So I'll, I'll try and get Cliffy in the room. Awesome. Well, I think the Gears community obviously wants to see the game come back to the MLG Pro Circuit. Um, it's, you know what, there's three things. I'm telling you right now, if three things are addressed and if the community, and this is the other thing that I really like is the Gears community, you know this, I, I had this conversation with you. The, the knock on the Gears community was, was that there was like, um, how do I say this politely? They were just <laughs> insanely aggressive, loud, and you know, boisterous, and verging on disrespectful. Guy, the messages I get out of the Gears of War community about thanking me for trying or just you know doing what I can, honestly, it's like it, I love it. I, it. It's a really fantastic indication of the maturity level of that group. And I'll be I'll, the other thing I'll say: if you look at a group that's got, just got an incredible in, like. There's an incredible amount of personality in that community. And with our new kind of approach as a media business and all the distribution channels we have, I mean, I'd love to put some of these guys up there on a big stage and, and, and feature it properly and have real money. And, and, you know, we'll see. I mean, no matter how well Call of Duty does this year, in the back of my mind, back, you know, bottom of my heart, I mean this, I would love to get to a place where next year we've got Gears of War on the circuit in a really meaningful way. Yeah, no, I think, you know, I mean, for VV Gaming, we got our start in Gears. I'll tell you a story, you know, I had this conversation with Arctic because he failed to mention a VV team in his recent blog. And I gave him a really hard time about it because, you know, when I, uh, when we first started, I would think I spent a lot of time, for those of you who are listening and have been around since uh, 07, will remember uh, 
you know, at the time, and I, this goes taking back to, to, I think, how powerful being a part of the MLG community is, the MLG experience is, I prefer to be the person behind the scenes. I prefer to be the person, you know, I was asked to coach even, and I coached, but that's not ever where I wanted to be, you know. I remember the constant debates. I think it was one Dan Bauer who, uh, who next he will remember very well, and, you know, these constant debates, and it was always about how Gears of War should be played and whether the shotgun was too random and whether or not there should be a sniper rifle. You know, we had a very particular style we worked hard to develop. We were always shotgun focused and we minimized the sniper rifle and that was just the VV style of playing and what we fought for. And when we walked into Meadowlands in 07 and we won, you know, it wasn't just a validation of, for me personally, it wasn't just a validation of, of the four players in front of us, but it was a validation that this was a phenomenal competition that people could walk into a major league gaming setting never having played at a LAN event before and it's probably that impression is what it probably made me keep throwing stones you know at that time it wasn't you uh per se you know, we had, <laughs> but kept throwing stones wanting it to be better and I think there were you know mob gaming was around and I very different from Vince and even very different from Paul from FBI at that time but you know uh we had worked very hard to get players to look at gears a certain way and obviously winning meant a lot of people would adopt that play style and it worked and i know in arctic's blog you said that gears wasn't spectator friendly and i have to say that i completely disagree i think gears is probably the most spectator friendly game you've had on the circuit outside of the fighting genre which is very very you know one character another character they're fighting but i think in the fighting genre uh, even though easy to spectate a lot of the moves get missed but in gears i thought uh, you had a, a lot more simpler uh, model. And I think Call of Duty actually has some simplicity too. So I kind of share with you in your heart this sort of like, I'd love to see it be successful. One last question, because we've asked it in every other sort of genre. What can the Gears community do? Well, you know, I, I think I would never advocate spamming Cliffy B's Twitter account or anything of those natures. But, you know, I know Arctic is... Um, big fan of his and you know i think he you know he's been involved in this for a long time and his posts are great and, and, and generally he's in he, from directional standpoint he's he's going in the right direction but you know the big thing is is that there's no signing a web petition there's no posting in forums that's going to change it the thing that will change it I, is, and i'm going to interrupt you again sonny i, I just want to make this clear to everybody listening that is not how we're going to make this happen yeah and I, I can't stress that enough. I wish it was as simple as a web petition. I wish it was as simple yeah, as it's, getting it's, all the Gears community on their forums. It's not how the business works. Right. Here's, here's what it has to happen. I can't stress this enough. You've got to, if this is important enough to you, which I think it is, I think, I think especially the Gears community is up there, you know, like the last thing they want to be is the next Counter-Strike community, right, where they're playing it an outdated game and, and reminiscing about way back when what you need to do is you need to band together. You know, you need to think about when, you know, and I'll do, uh, you know, I'll, again, I'll do my part, but it's about when the figureheads in the community, when you see activity, when you see something happening, right, you respectfully and constructively contribute to any dialogues you see. And what I mean by that is, yeah, you're, we're all on forum sites. Uh, we're all, you know, we're all out there. We're all playing the game. But so when you're playing the game, let's say it's, it's Gears Three comes out or the beta opens up, right? Don't go online and act like a complete douchebag, right? Say good game, be respectful. Like, if you're playing against people, you know, fine. But my point is like, is this? If you're going to say, you know, if you're in any way, shape, or form publicly aligned around competitive gaming, right? This goes back to what I was talking about before with pro players and getting sponsored. Be a spokesperson, right? Jerry said before, you know, you may not like Sarah Palin or you may not like Barack Obama, or you may, right? But the fact is, is these people represent ideals to a percentage of the community's you know, mind, right? So they, they represent ideals that either they gravitate towards or they're, they're, they're repulsed by, right? Wait, what we need to understand is that we are still the minority in this world from the perspective of the studio and the publisher and the marketer, okay? And guess what? In real life, 
That's what matters. Not whether or not the game is the best competitive game out there, not whether or not we can all put our name on something, but it's how we communicate, how we carry ourselves publicly in, in all the forums that, that, that we're a member of. And by forum, I don't just mean web forum. I mean, you know, whatever, whether it's you're talking to people at school, on campus, or wherever it is, represent yourself well, right? Because out of that, here's what's going to happen. More people are going to gravitate towards it. More people are going to align with it, okay? The web stuff, in terms of petitions and forum posts, that's fantastic for ourselves, right? And for maybe the one or two guys within each studio who are responsible for monitoring the community stuff. But it's got to be much bigger than that. And you know what? I, again, I said this on uh, State of the Game, but it comes down to really, really simple things. It's economics, my friend. If you support the existing activity, and I'm, I'll use MLG as an example because I run it, but, or if you're Blake Starcraft and you watch GOM, whatever, it, like, you've got to participate. You've got to be an active, involved community member. That's what they want. That's what they want to see. They want to see a rich, vibrant community, which is plugged in and which is vocal and which is impactful. So look, all this stuff is great. And I, you know, I think the personalities we're out there talking about are fantastic. But what I need to do is I need to walk into a meeting and not have somebody say, oh, so you're the guy who basically is the Pied Piper for 5 million 13-year-old internet tough guys. And you bring up a really good point right there and something that I think pro players talk to me about being professional gamers. And I think to myself, you know, being a professional gamer is actually taking a 13, 14, 15 year old who you just who who is raging against you and gets mad at you and not responding, screw off, I'm an MLG pro, but actually saying, Hey, you know, you actually have a lot of skill, you've got some potential, here's what you're doing wrong, you know, if you ever want pointers, hit me up. And never once using the idea of being a pro player as a sense of I'm better than you, but actually using what you know is a pro player, and I, and I want to stress this, it's not your status in life that matters. It's the ideas that you have. It's not that because I'm this, you should do this. It's simply this is going to help you do better. Yeah. A lot of them need help with that, you know, be able to do that. Uh, no, I, I agree. I think, you know, you know, we're recruiting, right? I mean, for lack of a better word, uh, you know, Jerry, just as you recruit community members and you put them through a rigorous test to make sure that they, they can uphold the ideals, right? And you want a certain moral fiber and character, right? Well, we're, we're recruiting too because, again, remember, most people on this planet don't really understand the concepts of competitive gaming today. In order for us to change that in the next five years, which I think we will and we're on track to, we've got to recruit. We've got to recruit parents and siblings and girlfriends and all. You know, everybody's got to be pulled in. Right? I'm not saying they need to participate in the, in the competition, but they do need to participate in the community. Right? They need to spectate. They need to be, you know, we have an opportunity to, to, to do more there. So I just can't stress it enough. No, I um, think uh, to add to that, you know, many uncles, fathers, wives, brothers can say something very simple about a loved one. They're into cars. And we all know what it means. Uh, I think a lot of us know what it means when someone's into cars. We may not be into cars. We're not threatened by them being into cars. But we can appreciate that they like to work and build on cars. We need, in my humble opinion, to get competitive gaming to be both as innocuous and as common as that very thing. That someone can say, oh, Cousin Robert's uh, into cars and, and, and Cousin Jane – She's really into competitive gaming, you know, yeah. so that it's always something that people do and it's no more threatening than being into cars or being into whether you're old fashioned, it's ham radio or whether you're into wine tasting. It should be that so that being a fan of it, being a part of it is like being a football fan or a baseball fan. But, you you know, we to give Cliffy B some sort of uh, legitimacy, we said people who use their knowledge of competitive gaming to belittle other people are horrible ambassadors for what we're trying to do. Absolutely. Absolutely. And it drives me nuts. To be honest with you. It's not what we're about. I think all I'm saying is this is again, we're, we're, we're going into a much broader topic and something that really 
I feel incredibly strongly about it. I mean, I've got kids. I've got two sons, and then I've got a third son on the way, right? So here's, here's what it, it's about. My eight-year-old son, the first event we ever had, he was there in a stroller, okay? His whole life, he's known MLG very closely. He comes to events with me. He was in Raleigh last year. The other day, he comes home. He's like, Dad, can you sign an MLG hat for me? And I said, what, you want my autograph? And he laughed. He's like, yeah. And I said, is it for you? He's like, no, it's for a friend at school. And he said, okay, tell me about their friend. And he's like, well, he's not in my class. He's older than I am, but I see him in the lunchroom, and he saw me in the MLG T-shirt, and he came over and asked me about it, and I told him who you were, and, and he asked, he's like, oh, my God, you know. And so my 8-year-old son's surrounded by all these 11, 12-year-old kids talking about MLG and how he's, you know, Sajid telling them he's been to five events. These kids are the ones who are looking at you and picking up behavior, okay? My son is a fan of the guys who play on our circuit. And when I sit there and I look at them and I say, I need you to uphold a very simple idea, which is you can talk smack in game. You can, you can let it get to you. You can, you know, but again, there's a line you don't cross. You finish the game, you stand up, you shake hands, you leave it in the game and you say, you know what? Maybe you won today, maybe you lost today, but you, you learned from it, you're a better person for it, and it's, you know, it's something that means a lot to you. This is the conundrum, right? And this is just like with organized sports. I'm not handing out ribbons for fifth place. I'm, you know, I'm not an everybody gets ribbons guys, but I am an everybody gets character guy, right? And so what we need to do a better job of is just being respectful, having some pride in ourselves, and doing this stuff the right way. Look, I played sports competitively and I was, I was what you would call an asshole. I mean, I was really aggressive and I didn't like losing and I, I used to yell at my teammates. But you know what? I had a coach once who basically said, you know what? I don't give a shit. You're, not, you, you're one of our best players. You're sitting. Show, learn some respect. I was like, oh my God, really? You, we're going to lose. He's like, I'd rather lose with the guys on the floor. We're going to do it the right way than win with you on the floor. Never acted that way again. Never acted that way again. And you that's cared, true. and yeah, absolutely. You know? That's it. It's not about, again, It's we have to be a little more selfless, and that's one of the problems that our community has. Is we've all got to understand that we're doing this together, and the way that we're going to get to where we all want to be, which is, I, come on, you know, Jerry, in a couple of years, I want to be sitting back watching this thing from the sidelines, right? And I want to yeah. see the next generation of guys. Yeah, I want to, absolutely. Right? I tell, tell my staff every day, I said, you know, this is, BB Gaming goes beyond me. You know, I want to give me a plaque somewhere and let me sit back and have a drink and watch yeah, and smile. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. I mean, that's absolutely. Why I mean, look, Jerry, you and I would be doing other things. <laughs> There's, that's the point. So, I don't know. If you've taken the time to listen to this, if you're a member of VVV or just if you're here listening to this just for shits and giggles or it's the first time listening to this podcast, just everybody spread this one thing if you only spread one, one, one part of any of what we're talking about. It's up to us. It's up to you guys. It's up to us working together, figuring this out, and basically presenting a case that other people will understand so why this is so important to us. You know, and you know what it is? As a community, we're more alike than we are dissimilar. And that's a fantastic thing. It doesn't matter what game you play. It doesn't matter where you're from, what you look like, if, what you, your voice sounds like, color, creed, race, any of those things. It doesn't matter. What matters is that you get in-game the game is the language you speak. The competition is pure. And at the end of it, you're better off, win or lose, for the experience. And that's it. Just, I, I, you know, it's happening. I'm seeing it happen. It's just the last challenge is really getting the community fully activated around it. Because the day that happens, that's the day that this is cement. It's not going away. I was going to say something. It's the one thing that has really made this 60th episode special for us is your passion and your honesty. I think. Uh, if I can say this, this is the most transparent. This is the Sundance that I know from our conversations that I think you've been on the show a couple times. And I'm going to tell you, I'm just really pleased that you are as transparent and honest as you've probably been in any show. And I really appreciate that. And I'm going to bring it back down because I know <laughs> you and I can talk about this and we will talk about this more forever. And I want to get a last few kind of loose thread questions out there that a lot of people have been talking about. One thing I want to cover is there are a lot of other things cropping up. There is – and I want to cover a wide diaspora of them. So 
they're not really related, but I want to get maybe 30 seconds of what you feel comfortable talking about. Um, in Halo, there's the LAN network. Yep. And in there's the North American Star League. And then, obviously, IGN. Pro it's League. Pro League uh, that was now leaked on uh, Team Liquid. And I know you're not competing with any of these, and that's not the reason I'm asking this question. But maybe sharing the community some of uh, what you know about it or what you feel comfortable sharing about these other things going on in North America and uh, what you see and if you have anything that uh, would help the community evaluate what they're seeing. So I'll start with the LAN network. Big, I'm a big fan of the LAN network, and, and, and you know, Joe has become a, a, a friend and you know, what he does for those kids is it's amazing. It's fantastic. You know, the issue is that Joe is an individual who's in a situation where he's investing in this. And, you know, it, it's tricky and there's a lot of cost there. So, you know, I, I think we will, you know, be formally working with the land network to try and support it, make sure it doesn't go away, make sure that that lives on and maybe even broadens out a little bit to some other games or, or, or things similar to the land network. You know, and it's really, I mean, it's a fantastic, it's a fantastic forum and a fantastic opportunity for Halo players right now. NASL, you know, had some conversations with them before they released their position. I think that what you see them doing, you know, uh, to be honest, we'll, we're going to be doing something similar soon. I mean, we're, these six big scale live, live events are cornerstone, but they're not going to be the only thing we're doing this year around our games and around StarCraft, uh, especially. Uh, I was just out in Irvine meeting with the CEO and CEO of Blizzard to to have discussions about what we can do together, and, and we're going to be following up with that pretty soon. And, you know, there's a question in terms of sustainability with, with NSL, NASL, whichever you want to say. So the issue there is that this is a tricky business. It's an expensive business, and I, I think that what they're doing is great. Uh, and I hope it works, but I, you know, again, we're trying to figure out how we can work together to support uh, and supplement um, the IGN thing. Again, you know, I've had conversations with their CEO, and again, I think there's a lot of opportunistic thinking in the marketplace. I hope that we get to a point where whatever they you know they end up doing works well for the community. It doesn't segment. I mean, my big concern is that in StarCraft, you know, you can point this a finger at StarCraft Two and say it's all your fault. If, if it segments the audience out and so people are forced to choose between too many events, they're running concurrently, that's not good for anybody. Saturation is bad. And I'm in a position where, well, hell, I'm going to be profitable this year for the first time and, and, you know, in, in a pretty substantial manner. So you know, I, I'm good. I know what I can do. It's not a new investment for me. Um, IGN, is, you know, they're a sizable business that's got to support large infrastructure and i don't know that this world is a pretty tricky world so i'll I'll reach out to roy i'll see if we can work with them and see if maybe we can help them avoid some mistakes but at the end of the day what i want to do is i want to make sure that again i've been accused of giving all my industry secrets away to competitors did this with some of the folks at cgs and wsvg the reason is is that if you're going to throw an event i honestly i don't want people anybody to screw up an event because it's bad for everybody but I understand the, the larger issue, which is you've got to have a sustainable business model. Like I said, if I'd been running this company for longer, we'd be further along. But now that I am running it, I know exactly what we're capable of. I, I can't speak for these other folks. You know, I don't know if I don't know if Star League's got a sustainable business model in place. I don't know if IGN has a multi-year investment queued up because you know these aren't small sums of money. I hope I certainly hope so um, because I want more opportunity for the players. You know, just like everyone else does, but. I don't consider it bad other than the potential for oversaturation because, again, we got to do it right. Otherwise, it's just going to, you know, one of the worst things that came out of, you know, saturation in the marketplace back when there was us, WSVG, and CGS was overspending in a competitive kind of arms race kind of a way. And we didn't really, you know, nobody evolved the, the, the industry or the scene. Everybody was just, you know, kind of competing with one another as a corporate entity, and that's not good for the community. So we'll see. You know, I think a lot of stuff will play out this summer. Um, but it's it's encouraging that there's a, this much activity. It's a shame that it's all around one game, though, is the only thing I would say. I, I wish it was, it was a little bit more diversity. No, and I mean, I think that's good that you're bringing balance, and I think uh, you have to differentiate yourself in the marketplace. And, you know, StarCraft is a phenomenal title. No one's going to ever disagree with that but there's a lot of other gaming 
going on outside of StarCraft. And right, right. The thing with StarCraft is, to be quite honest, Korea owns that competitive scene for today. And nothing that's been put forward yet uh, addresses that. What we're doing longer form does, but the Korean scene is, I mean, it makes what, it makes what everybody's doing look small. I mean, we're, we're talking with Gom and we're going to be working with those folks. Look, you know, there's no doubt about it. The American players who are over there would love to come home and, you know, be in a more familiar environment and play competitively. But that's the big leagues right now for StarCraft, you know, and I'd say we're, we're a distant second and these other things are unproven, but we'll, we'll see what happens this year. You know, I'm really excited about some of the opportunities that our, our conversation with Blizzard have opened up. All right, I'm going to ask you a few questions from the community. Okay. And then we're going to finish this up because you've been so generous with your time again, Sundance. I cannot thank you enough. One question that we haven't had a chance to come around to is about, about spectating at the event. You know, you mentioned StarCraft. That might be a good example. But some StarCraft players have asked, will there ever be booths or some ways that StarCraft players will have more isolation from the crowd? And on the opposite end, we've asked, we've had fans who've asked, uh, can we stand behind players and watch, or can we expect the same setup we had last year? Are there any changes in that space? Is it the same as it was last year? Well, I, you know, it's changed. It's different. I think you know, the competition floor or the or the competition pits are not open for a reason. You know, it's these are thousands of dollars on the line. You know, so unless it's on a feature station, which all games will have a feature station, or on a main stage, all games will have a main stage, you are going to be somewhat limited in your viewing options. But through the magic of replays and VODs, and you know what, hopefully we'll get those matches up for people to watch, and there'll always be something happening, there'll always be a, 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 a spectator experience in place. Uh, in terms of the StarCraft main stage area, you know, in Korea, they do the noise-canceling headphones, they blast music, and they've got the booths. We're doing our version of that. It's not, you know, for us to make this work, we need to, you know, we need to kind of split the difference of that. So, you know, I don't think we're going to have a Mothership Rush incident like we did last year where the in-game, you know, the crowd and the in-game chat led to a really great little uh, <laughs> viral kind of exchange going on, but... We, we want to try and eliminate some of those concerns. But again, remember when we first started with Halo, for example, when broadcasting the screens, I, I remember this very vividly in Philly back in the day, people yelling out location in the audience. I mean, that's how disrespectful the audience was. So we'll get there. I mean, we don't want to stop the crowd from being able to cheer, cheer and rant and get into it. But we also need to, there's a certain etiquette that's, that's just required. And, and we're getting that behavior kind of out there in, in a, a bigger, more kind of you know, concrete way this year. And finally, I want to talk about the fact that a lot of our community is going to be looking at the streams, is going to be watching from home. What can they expect differently? Um, any score tracking on the streams? Octashape still going to be the distributor? What are some of the improvements that the, the at-home fans can expect? Okay, so I, I will give you, Jerry, because I like you, I'll give you... I'll give you a couple. <laughs> That's two more than I had before this conversation, <laughs> yeah. so we're good. Um, we're we're going to be instituting. Uh, we're working on instituting our version of fantasy sports around StarCraft. That is big news. Yeah. So the idea would be that you've got your pick of the you know you take your pick from the bracket and how these guys play and 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 their performance in certain key areas turn into points and. You know, you'll be able to track and compete over the weekend. You know, we want to do stuff like an NCAA bracket, but, you know, honestly, we're going to do that later in the year just because we, we need to get a foothold on, on who the good teams are and who the good players are and, you know, kind of who's showing up and whatnot. From the octo-shape question, because I know everybody has, you know, but there will be a non-octo-shape delivery mechanism for standard definition viewers, meaning if you don't buy the high definition pass and i can't imagine that you wouldn't because it's so good and it's got dvr and all these other things built in and um, very inexpensive <laughs> and you can get it as part of our membership package which is not yet announced you for all the events for less than it will cost to buy each one anyway you will be able to get a non octoshape version of our stream in, in standard definition there is going to be 
you know, we're figuring out exactly how the chat mechanism is going to work, whether we do IRC around it. We've got the Mebo bar on the MyMLG, so you'll be able to talk with your friends while you're watching. The, the entire game time experience, that's what we call the website, what it turns into during the live event weekends. The game time experience has been uh, improved significantly, but it's still not where it's going to be by event two or event three, you know, and even the end of the year. So we've made improvements. We've listened, and the all the octo shape complaints from the past. We think a lot of that's going to be addressed with the custom player that we have. Like you're not going to have an install. It's just going to be it's going to be much more seamless. And if we still have issues, what you'll see by the next event is everything is going to be rolled into our Bright Cove player environment. So that's much different. You'll be in a in a place later in the year where really it's going to be limitless in terms of what that video experience is like. So, you know, all that stuff is, it's works in progress, but, but I can promise you this, that we've, we've made a lot of improvements and we're going to continue to invest in that. Well, so Nance, I want to thank you so much for sharing all that. I know you didn't have to. And I think for, at least in the VV community, a lot of our fan base will not be able to make it to an event. I mean, they are passionate, but you know, they rely on that stream to be in contact and you know you also hinted an nc2a type bracket i mean and and plus a fantasy league sounds to me like that's a lot of stuff for fans and players to chew on and i thank you for sharing that as always sundance i want to give you an opportunity to give any shout outs any final words uh anything you'd like to add no well first i want to thank you guys um again you know if you think back you know, it wasn't that long ago that we were initiating the first kind of conversation, Jerry, and, and to the VVV community and to the, the, the broader, you know, competitive gaming community. Yeah, you know, I, I just want to thank you guys because I'm here and you may not get this, it may not read this way, but you know, if I were sixteen years old, I'd be in, in your shoes. I'd be sitting here wondering what the next thing the league's gonna do. You know, can I afford to get to an event? Am I gonna be able to get onto a team? And I take this stuff incredibly seriously and it's a very personal endeavor for me because you know i'm passionate about this i'm here because i choose to be and and i know you're here because you choose to be and uh, i i just you know as i always do i ask you keep me honest you know let me know what you're thinking my email address is public it's sd at mlgpro.com and and the most important thing you know that i can ask of anybody is together you know working together pushing this forward just don't underestimate the power of a all of us pointing in the same direction and working towards the same goal. Um, and like I said, if, if for some reason at some point in time, if I'm not doing the best job, I'm okay with that. I just want to see this be realized uh, to its fullest potential. And, you know, as always, Jerry, thanks for having me. And, and thanks to the guys for being here and, and taking the time. I believe I can speak for all of us here in the VV gaming community and heck for the entire competitive gaming community in general by saying a huge thank you to Sundance to Giovanni, the CEO of MLG, for sharing his time with us tonight and giving us so much information about the upcoming 2011 season and, heck, MLG in general. Huge thanks, as always, to the VV sponsors, Steel Series, Control Freak, MusicSkins.com, GamerLogos.net, and then, of course, Custom Inc. Additionally, a big shout-out to the providers of our intro and outro music. That'd be the band Power Glove. If you haven't had the chance, go check them out. They are going on a national tour very soon. If you get the chance, go out, support them. They're great guys. Big thanks to the VV Gaming community and to the competitive gaming community all the way around. We love you guys. Thanks for your feedback and support. Be sure to stop by our podcast homepage. The website is vvvgaming.podbean.com. Additionally, you can also subscribe to us on iTunes or Zoom Marketplace. Just look up VVV Gaming. You'll find our shows there, of course, The Loser's Bracket, and our Smash Brothers podcast, Directional Influence. You can email us at thelosersbracket at vvv-gaming.com. If you feel like sending us a tweet, our Twitter name is simply Loser's Bracket. Thank you so much for listening in, guys. We really hope that we get to see all of you out at MLG Dallas. I know I personally will be there. Relent, you're going to be there as well, right? Yes, of course, and Sundance is now on my hug list. <laughs> I hope that doesn't end up like uh, the guy who tackled him last week, but we shall see. No, I'll be gentle with him. Don't you worry. 
Oh, I don't know how I should feel about the way you just said that. But either way, as I said at the top of the show, this is our final Losers Bracket episode before the start of the MLG season next week in Dallas. We're taking a week off next week to prepare for the event, so we hope to see you back after the event has come to its conclusion, and we'll be wrapping everything up. So until then, guys, take care, and we hope to see you there. Thank you all for listening. We will see you after MLG Dallas. Enjoy, everyone.